financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vanu Podcast. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. Today is no different. I'm Kyle and... I'm Shane. And since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, the Vanu Podcast is covered by Bipcot No Government License. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at Bipcot.org. So Shane, how's uh, life been living under the uh, the boot of the uh, communist state of Illinois thus far? Well, it's always been pretty terrible, uh, obviously, but uh, you know there, there's there's uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I actually uh, you know just found out today uh, that I'll be heading down to Southern Illinois this weekend. So uh, you know uh, the, the all of the uh, terrible things, like the, I guess the just did it, all of the terrible aspects about being here, you know, uh, uh, are going to disappear for a few days. Uh, so I can go to my utopia, I guess you could call it. Although it's a real place, so it's not actually utopia, right? Uh, so you know, yeah, you know, things things are looking up now. I'll get to uh, get out of this hellhole for a few days. So, uh, you know, really uh, looking forward to that. Well, that's 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 definitely good to hear. Uh, let's see. On my end, actually, kind of two things that kind of cropped up. One is, and considering our previous episode on van nomadism. Uh, yeah, apparently, uh, my, my car got kind of hit with like a $350 repair on the engine. And, uh, you know, thankfully I don't have to be at work for the next couple of days, uh, because I have flex scheduling or whatever it is. And so, yeah, there are days where I'm working 10 hours a day and other days where I'm just at home. But, um, yeah, I, I just kind of was thinking like, did Rao ever do like his own, uh, repairs on his van or did he like have to like hire somebody to fix it? Because that, that's something that never came up in the book. I don't think he ever specified. Um, yeah, I don't think he ever specified. That's a good point. Uh, I don't know. I, I would imagine, you know, if I had to, if I had to posit a guess, uh, yeah, I, I would think that he probably did, you know, most of the maintenance. Uh, he was he's, he was definitely kind of that engineer engineering, you know, kind of technical type of person. Uh, and f- just from, uh, you know, transcribing from Bonnie Life March 1973, uh, his two, um, uh, there was one check sen- section on, uh, how to build and design with natural timbers, and there's also uh, once without fire, complete plans for a $55 foam hut. Uh, and there were very technical articles. So I, I think you know Rayo, being a formidable person that he was, uh, I think he probably could have handled basic maintenance at least, uh, if not more than that. Yeah, and so maybe that's a potential uh, season three episode, more about like uh, car maintenance or whatever. Because of course, if you get stranded at the side of the road, whether or not you're doing the van nomadism thing or or not, if you get stranded at the side of the road, you are vul- more vulnerable to coercion than you were before, right? Yeah, so, exactly. And if you can't fix it, and you have to just sit there and wait, uh, yeah, even more so. So I, I would imagine, yeah, I would imagine, you know, just kind of. Going off that alone, uh, I, I think, you know, Rayo probably could handle, you know, most things that, that could possibly go wrong. Uh, but, you know, that's just a guess. That's just a guess. I don't think he'd want to put himself in a position where, you know, he, he had to rely upon somebody else because that's not the type of person he was. Uh, so if something happened, he wanted to be the one to fix it is kind of the way that I, that I kind of yeah, I understand him from, from I guess, our, our uh, looking at it from like 40 years later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah some, something like that. And, uh, oh, something else, too. I think there was that ep- a couple episodes ago where he mentioned about, uh, p- you know, buying private land. or And, and then there was kind of the, the segue on, like, a lodial title and a couple other things. It's interesting. You know, I was reading a book about, uh, I think it's literally called uh, Buying Rural Land in Texas by some sort of scholar whose name I honestly don't remember. And it was interesting. He very much poo-poos the idea of, like, buying land as, like, something to pass on to your heirs. But he views private land ownership only as a vehicle to like making profit, whether in the context of land speculation or as was he was mainly pushing for um, uh, really agricultural, you know, like farming profits and such. And so in terms of trying to be invulnerable to to coercion, in terms of like uh, in some cases even hiding, um, I'm now starting to even more appreciate uh, Rayo's skepticism regarding private land ownership, because even this more mainstream book was saying, and specifically in here in Texas, how uh, owning uh, land privately in Texas may not be all that it's chalked up to be. 
Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. And, and, and I mean, there, I guess there is something to be said, um, you know, like with, with our lane in Southern Illinois, my dad bought, you know, that first piece when he was uh, in high school. And I think he, we, we just, we bought his initially, you know, 20, 30, 40 acres. Uh, and, uh, you know, he paid, uh, he paid cash for that. And it was like 700, like, I don't remember, it was, it was very, very cheap uh, when he purchased the land, like maybe 750 bucks an acre or something like that cheap. And, uh, you know, by the time he sold it, I think it was worth two or three grand. Um, you know, and that'd be 25 years later or thereabouts. So there's some, there's something to be said. If you're going to hold on to it for a long time, you know, maybe there'd be that profit, I guess, that, that profit opportunity available there. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly understand Rayo's arguments and also the, the one that that guy made uh, in the book that you're referring to about how, you know, land speculation, just kind of, you know, holding on to it for profit um, is, is a good avenue. So that's, that, that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's yeah. So obviously, folks, I've been kind of uh, doing some advanced research for uh, season three episodes. And yeah, there's some there's some details and sometimes even nuance and minutia that makes life uh, very interesting, uh, at least in some sense or another. So, again, kind of like how Rayo mentioned about like how Vanu is not an all or nothing thing. There very much is a spectrum in sorts. Uh, shades of gray, at least in some sense, then yeah, I'm really now seeing it now that, you know, getting to the actual direct action, uh, more specific methods of Vano and all that, that, uh, yes, um, there, there's a lot of options. That's true. But then, then again, you have to tailor it uh, to yourself. You know, it has to be tailored to specific individuals very, because, you know, not all so solutions, quote unquote, not all solutions work equally for, for everyone. Right. What may w well work for you may not work well for the man standing next to you and so forth. Right, right. And I guess I guess one of the know it might be a good idea to uh, forward the title of that book on to Derek Bros for when they, uh, you know, start their intentional community because they're going to have to purchase, you know, private land when they do that. So I don't, I don't know. Yeah, if you send me a link to that, I'll just forward it on to him because he, he was actually the one. I don't know if I mentioned this on the on, on, on the last episode, but he was actually the one that sent me the uh, Vonnie Life March 1973. So I don't know what he was looking for. I think he's intrigued now, but that's uh, that, that's uh, that's good. Uh, but yeah, you know, I might be valuable to him as well. So, you know, after the show, I'll get that from you and, and uh, you know, I'll forward it on to him. Sure, of course. And uh, obviously, I haven't finished reading that book yet. So I'm not uh, I'm not 100 percent on whether I think the author is uh, is off base or not. But I'm I'm pretty much a couple chapters in and there's a consistent pattern of if essentially and it's not even the words he's using. It's the tone of the book where basically if you're not making uh, financial profit from the land, you're basically an idiot for taking on all this risk, like in the form of property taxes and, and so forth. It's kind of like where he's coming from. Um, oh. That oh and, oh, and that's another thing, too. He said, actually, this is rather important. There's also a, a recurring theme of people who are, are emotionally attached to land are idiots because they're essentially kind of setting the preconditions for their own financial you know, bankruptcy. As opposed well, I to, a, I guess I'm an idiot then. <laughs> as opposed to dispassionate uh, investors, uh, whether in the form of speculation or agricultural development and so forth, uh, who are who are going to uh, be quote unquote successful. But really, what he meant is making bank on on uh, off of land ownership. He was he even one more step and said even people who buy rural land and then develop it, it turn into a freaking shopping mall, are smart, successful people. So this book is very mainstream. However, what's what's good about it tentatively is that it's focusing on, as the title goes, buying rural land in Texas. So it's location to, to this part of America with a K, and it's more about rural land. So in terms of like private land ownership that you may want to consider hiding your van on or whatever else, or as is the case with this particular episode on uh, on a Vanu shelter, uh, yeah, the the private land ownership that we've covered on previ that previous episode, yeah, Rayo's skepticism I think is well founded because this very mainstream book I'm reading on 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 land here in Texas is uh, who it is. Ooh, I don't know the right adjective. I would say cynical, but I don't think that quite does it justice. It's very. Um, it's very shrewd. There we go. That's the right word. It's a very shrewd way of looking at land ownership. And I was just like, oh, mm. my gosh. And the worst part is that in some sense, he's probably right, because he was also mentioning legal issues when like when somebody dies and they try to pass the land on to their children. The fact that the children usually more often than not in terms of our experience in dealing with these legal matters is that the children pretty much like bicker with each other for like six months to a year or more trying to try to come up with an equitable settlement and sometimes he even goes to court 
the government courts, uh, there you go, the government courts who then kind of impose a ruling uh, basically selling at far below uh, market value. So then everybody loses out. So like the, mm. there's some more stuff going on there in terms of just land ownership here in Texas. But again, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can say that maybe for a season three episode possibly. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's certainly an interesting uh, you know subject to cover in season three as we kind of develop uh, beyond that. Uh, yeah, luckily you know I don't think I'll run into any of those issues. Uh, at least uh, you know you know uh, feuding with my brother, we get along pretty well. At least as of now, you know things change, right? Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but you know ho hopefully that uh, you know stays the. I don't see anything any reason why that would why that would change. But uh, yeah, that's a uh, sounds like an interesting book and sounds like he's uh, you know at least in line with Ray on at least that that one aspect. Yeah, so far would seem to be the case. So, ladies and gentlemen, this episode is entitled Vanu Shelters in Vulnerable Home Bases. And the show notes can be found at vanupodcast.com slash 25. So is there anything you'd like to mention before we uh, go on, Shane? I guess just just one thing, real 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 briefly. You know, as as we've covered, you know, Rayo's Rayo's baby. You know, when it came to strategy was strategies was kind of the van nomadism. That was his, you know, his uh, you know primary and his first, you know, Vani uh, home base. His Vani shelter was uh, was that van, uh, and obviously they moved into the uh, polyethylene a tent. Uh, you know, kind of split splitting time between that and the van. Uh, so those were you know Rayo's two forms of of, of uh, you know Vani shelter, Vani home bases, and those terms will be used synonymously. Um, but also keep in mind that the last couple of episodes we've done on, you know, van nomadism and minimal sailboating, uh, you know, those, you know, also, those obviously also could be, uh, you know, Vanu home bases and Vanu shelters. So, uh, Vanu home bases can either be temporary autonomous zones or permanent autonomous zones. Uh, obviously, you know, more issues to be dealt with, uh, when it comes to the, uh, to the passes, but yeah, that's all I've got. Yeah, so essentially whether the shelter is mobile like the sailboat or a van or something else or it's more uh, stationary, the point is that uh, Vanu shelters come in all shapes and sizes, at least to some extent, right? The main thing being it has to uh, facilitate uh, invulnerability to coercion, which I think will be a good segue to our definitions. So Shane, since you're the definition man, let's go around. What is a Vanu shelter, aka Vanu home base. Yeah, so a, a Vanu shelter or a Vanu home base, again using those synonymously, uh, is a, a hardened home that serves as a base of activity. Uh, such a structure is where a Vanuan is to be the most invul invulnerable to coercion, uh, and that that last part is the most important. Uh, you know, the Vanu home base is where where you're going to be most invulnerable to coercion, uh, and Ray will explain why uh, momentarily. But also important here is mentioning import export. Uh, which obviously will be, you know, I, I, I think it's valuable to, to redefine import-export and one-directional isolationism because they're so crucial to the volume home bases. I mean, that's like kind of the, the that's one, one part of the equation. Uh, so obviously import-export, uh, you know, is, is obviously very important when it comes to, to volume home bases uh, as well. All right, so let's uh, let's revisit that again. And obviously, uh, for folks who want more details on this beyond just the definitions here, uh, please go to our season one episode on I think it was the Servile Society where we really kind of uh, really lay down the law, so to speak, on import export. But yes, just as a quick refresher, Shane, what is import export? Yeah, so import export concisely explains how Vanuans, uh, you know, those who have an invulnerability to coercion, uh, how they relate to the servile society. Uh, so this is obviously extremely important because, you know, as I've said in previous episodes, uh, there's always going to be a state of servile society. Uh, you know, as, as far as I guess, that's that's just kind of my 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 outlook, and that's not it's not a it's 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 not it's not a good it's not good it's not bad it's just kind of neutral it's a recognition you know recognition of of that fact. Um, so obviously it's pretty important to you know, understand how, uh, you know, Van Venuans do relate to to that society uh, and how, you know, that uh, that trade is conducted. Um, so, yeah, that's that's basically it. Right. And this is all an import export is also further explicated by our next defined and revisiting this this again, one directional isolationism. So what is that? Yeah. So uh, a one directional isolation of import export is used to maintain access to the servile society's open but not free trading centers yet denying them access to a Vanuans home through importing goods and knowledge while exporting labor or products back out to the servile society. So it's very much, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, it's very much so you're, you're importing that good, those goods and knowledge from the servile society and you're exporting that, the labor and the products back out to it. 
uh, and it's very, very important that those things stay separate. Uh, it's, again, it's one direction, uh, one directional isolationism. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty crucial. Yeah, and just something to add on to that, I just thought of is that there is no shared culture at all because I think there was something Rayo mentioned elsewhere about how like how do you exist while being fully immersed within a philosophically alien society that's hostile to your values, um, and so the answer to that was import export one directional isolationism and so forth at least that that's what that's what kind of rayo thought was was a way of dealing with that so so in other words the relate the way that venuans relate to the servile society at most would be more commercial in nature because there is no shared culture so we we if we're doing the collective movementism routine one more time we are not one people at all not even close even if there was a we which there isn't uh, but we are not one people. And so therefore, since there is no culture, you know, there is no common heritage uh, or culture, uh, maybe a common language. But even then, the only reason for the common language is to facilitate commerce. You know, we're not we're not like uh, raising our kids together kind of thing. Right. Uh, well, we're on, not it's, going it's not, it's not because we live in America and we speak English. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, and of course, English as a language itself has now gone global, right? I mean, how do you, I mean, it's kind of like the old example, not to go too long on this, but just to wrap this up nicely. Like, how does the, uh, let's say, the Chinese uh, airport controller talk to the Russian pilot? Well, the reason that the Chinese air traffic controller can talk to the Russian pilot is that both of them are speaking in English. That's actually how l things run, but most people here in America with a K don't understand stuff like that. Because Again, to, to kind of wrap this up, it has been scientifically proven that American voters are irrational, and part of that are their biases. They have an anti-market bias for one, but they also have an anti-foreign bias. So they automatically kind of presume that foreigners are bad, even if they claim to be, you know, multiculturally sensitive, which they're not. And that's that's the lie from the left. But of course, the lie from the right is then claiming they value markets, where in fact they value uh, fascist uh, corporatism and so forth. You know, uh, subsidies to corporations and such, and 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 things more along those lines. Uh, uh, undue favors from the state. Uh, to be, to men who claim to be industrialists, who may even claim to be entrepreneurs and self-made men, but then of course couldn't actually run their corporations without uh, government subsidies, whether it's corn subsidies or whatever else. Um, and that's of course without uh, you know, the, and also the tax breaks that they get, but that you and I don't get. Um, and so forth. So that kind of shows you the value of the special interest lobbying and all that. So considering all that and more, yeah, we we are not one people, not even freaking close. And so, yeah, so there, there is no common really anything. And so the only reason that we, we use the Federal Reserve notes or we, we communicate in English has nothing to do with culture and has everything to do with commerce and people just trying to survive. It's a question of survivability, not a question of how shall we then live. I, I get yeah I know I, I you're exactly right I guess just one one other I guess one one other comment here I get that there is you know one shared you know when it comes to the state of survival society and its and its inhabitants uh, there is one common bond and that bond is you know the belief in the state um, you know whatever for, to use whatever their whatever their uh, uh, to use it for whatever they want to use it for um, so if there was going to be one common bond it's not. Uh, uh, it's not freedom because you're here in America, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not the language. It's uh, the the only the only common thing is yeah, it's just their their belief in, in the state, uh, and, and and the fact that uh, you know they they think that um, you know violence is a good way to you know organize society. Uh, so I guess that'd be the only commonality between you know uh, you know not only the state of survival society here in America, but also you know around the world too. And and just just to kind of add on to that, the but in terms of like the relationship between the Nuans and the Servile Society, at most would be one of, would be commercial, hence import export, the one directional isolationism, because there there is nothing exactly. else. Right. There 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 is nothing else. And while maybe hypothetically some Venuans might be minarchists or polyarchists, maybe, um, you know, even they understand that the state is evil. So, you know, and so whether they need to exorcise even more spooks from their head is kind of something they need to deal with. But whether they be of the limited government or no government persuasion or or, or whatever, 
the point is that they know the state is evil. And even then, they're more kind of sensitive on like cultural issues and such. So yeah, as far as I'm aware of, the Nuins have nothing in common with the uh, alleged traditional uh, cultures of conservatism, and they have even less commonality, arguably, with the alleged, or shall we say, the real uh, cultural Marxism, right? And there's that too. So and any, any flavor of authoritarian fill in the blank, whether it's uh, a multiculturalism or whether it's a traditionalism, the new ones really don't, there's, there's nothing in common. There's, there's nothing there. And the only reason to deal with those in the servile society is for purpose of survivability because we just haven't simply be, built our own infrastructure yet of one kind or another. And I think Rayo even said something to that effect as well. Right, right, yeah. So uh, let's uh, let's look at what Red Rayo had to say regarding the Vanu shelters, because remember, the purpose of the Vanu shelters is that when we're not doing import export and we're just strictly on, you know, I guess you could say in our second realm away from the state, away from the servile society and so forth, away from that first realm, if you will, uh, that that so much tyranny is is rampant in. Uh, when we have our own stuff, if you will, our own infrastructure, like I mean, what like how do you go about building that? What does that look like? And I would suggest that the first, uh, or among the first of that second realm of sorts, would really be these Vanu shelters, basically people's like home bases that then could develop into other things. So let's look at what Rayo said. Quote: Have savings before moving. During your first year or two in a wilderness or other Vanu environment, expect to be occupied developing shelter and learning Vanu living skills. You will have little time for money earning, even if opportunities are at hand. Close quote. Um, I will just mention here, Shane, unless you have something else to add, that really for more information on financial independence, please see the uh, premiere episode of season two on financial independence. Right. I, yeah. I, I guess just yeah. So w w whenever you're beginning your journey as a new one, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna spend a lot of time developing shelter. If you just look at the you know even just a couple of articles that were in Vaughn of the Search Personal Freedom, uh, you can tell that's what can that that's what uh, you know really uh, took up most of uh, Rayo and uh, Halen or Roberta or Naomi uh, their the, their time. It took up a lot of their time developing shelter, uh, and that's uh, the largest section. Yeah, the largest section for sure in Body Life, March 1973. So that was something that they focused on pretty heavily, even in 1973, uh, you know, after they'd done this for almost 10 years. So uh, we're over 10 years. So just a, a note there. All right. Quote, don't change vocations until you achieve a Vanu home. If you can clear two dollars or more per hour in your present non Vanu job, you'll probably achieve Vanu quickest by staying with it until you have enough capital to cut loose for two years, close quote. Um, now, again, like when I wrote my article on, on financial independence and I had to like correct the, the inflation figures, obviously it's going to be a lot more than $2 per hour now in uh, this year of our Lord 2017, supposedly. Um, but yeah, the idea is the nest egg. That's the main idea here behind this particular quote is you need a nest egg before you can cut loose. Yeah, yeah, and you know, as the next quote will will kind of demonstrate. I mean, you know, the the first step before you do anything else, before you set up an ethical enclave, before you uh, do X, Y, or Z uh, in the context of Vanu, the first thing you do is you set up, a, you get your Vanu home base ready to go. Yep. All right. Quote: Vanu, your home first. Domestic activities: sleeping, eating, cleaning, grooming, mending, reading, writing, listening to music love making meditating exercising conversing child care etc comprise most of one's life a vanu home seems essential for psychological well-being and domestic activities are relatively easy to vanu they do not require elaborate equipment or deep involvement with outsiders close quote sorry i just thought of something remember elsewhere where uh, shane where uh <laughs> <laughs> the city psychological pressures that Rayo mentioned about. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's almost like the flip side of that is that the Vanu home is your uh, is your psychological well being. So. Yeah, yeah. And he says it seems essential. I mean, well, without a Vanu home base, I mean, what do you have? I mean, uh, 
Uh, yeah. Without a, without a secured volume home base, you'd be living in a tenth a ten a tenth floor apartment in Chicago or I I don't know I mean I I can't imagine volume without that volume home base it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense right so if you're not if you're not outside if you're not if you don't have that one directional isolationism then you're a part of the servile society uh, and again you know the city psychological pressures you know uh, that that obviously wouldn't wouldn't be good so I I can't see you know volume Working at all without that volume of home base, there's got to be that separation. There's got to be that, uh, I guess, uh, that partition between, you know, uh, um, the the coerced society uh, and then also, you know, kind of the you know, your home base where you're more invulnerable to coercion. Yeah, and um, I think we'll need to get into mean time to harassment to some degree. Uh, we'll probably do that a little bit later this episode, but I think it's kind of interesting, like like what counts as a volume of home because, like, I mean, like a level. Uh, you know, MTH or whatever. Uh, I mean, that's basically being homeless, quite literally. So, um, I mean, I guess there's that. So, I guess this would be more a C level and up, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, and whatnot. So, anyway, uh, quote. An optimally liberated lifestyle must involve a sort of one-directional isolation. The liberator maintains his access to their open but not free trading centers while denying them access to his home. This requires a skillful blend of concealment and deception, plus perhaps elements of mobility and deterrence. A free man obtains information, techniques, key equipment, and supplies out of the servile society, exporting labor or products in return. And during import-export activities, he practices deception, perhaps carries a driver's license, genuine or faked, perhaps pays some sales taxes he cannot conveniently avoid. But the free man's home base is physically concealed. There he spends most of his time. There he may sleep, imbibe, love, design, build trade with fellow freemen, and raise children in relative safety from the savages of state. A freeman's home must be a figurative castle, close quote. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, there was also the old English common law adage about a man's home is his castle. So I guess that would be the one directional isolation is, is the man's home is his castle. You know, going, you know, whereas the man's home is his castle is more of a legal interstice, to, to be fair. Right. No, I, I, yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly right. Um, but you know, I, I, a hundred percent agree with them. As, as I just said, you know, I don't see how, you know, Vanu can be a thing without a Vanu home base. I, I just don't, I just don't see, see it being possible at all. Um, but yeah, physically concealed. I mean, that's why, you know, mobility is absolutely, you know, uh, that's why you saw, you know, mobility is being absolutely crucial, uh, you know, hiding your van, you know, deep in the woods or, you know, uh, having a polyethylene a tent way out there, uh, having a shoe swap dwelling, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, I guess halfway underground or, you know, just completely, uh, completely underground structure uh, that, uh, you know, I think, like I, I, multiple sources, you know, kind of, you know, confirmed that, uh, you know, Rayo's, uh, you know, Rayo kind of ended out on, you know, underground dwellings, or at least that was his last known uh, dwelling. Uh, so yeah, physically concealed, you know, absolutely, absolutely important. And I remember it was, uh, oh, what, it, I think it was from Vonnie Life March 1973, uh, it might have been the 16 ways to live free, a critical evaluation, the the one that uh, was mirrored and also put out on uh, this podcast feed. But uh, so, yeah, he, all, he also mentioned along, something along the lines of, uh, I mean, you, you can find kind of these shelters that are built on like public lands, you know, out, out in the middle of national parks, um, but they weren't made for Vanu. Uh, you'll walk up on them and you'll notice them immediately or you notice them from a difference uh, from a distance. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, obviously that concealment is uh, is absolutely important. Uh, when it comes to a volume home base, because again, you know, going off of mean time harassment here, you're trying not to be discovered. Uh, that's that's kind of the entire goal. Right. And so I I would agree with Rayo that if you have a Vanu shelter, your MTH goes up. Um, however, I would also say that if we're talking like, you know, A level Vanu or B level Vanu, I, again, and oh, sorry, I should have said this earlier. Yeah, folks, for more information on Mean Time to Harassment, also known as MTH, please refer to our Season 1 episode on Mean Time to Harassment. But yeah, Shane, I mean, honestly, like A-level and B-level uh, Vanu, there's no shelters with either of those. The shelters really start at, at sea level, really, like the van nomadism and the minimalist sailboating. That's kind of the baseline for the Vanu shelters. Right, right. I mean, the the only possible way I could see for you know kind of the A level and B level, uh, C level would be like van dwelling uh, or van nomadism. The only sort of shelters I could see, you know, I guess you know coming about uh, would be like you know kind of those uh, like you just kind of lay some trees up against each other and like sleep underneath it. Like they'd be just really low, um, you know, activity sorts of things. So there might be you know some sort of shelter, but it would it would it would obviously be uh, would not be uh, high activity. Like you're not going to dig a big hole to live in. 
No. You're just gonna kind of maybe lay some sticks over and sleep underneath it. Uh, it's kind of kind of the idea there. I mean, maybe. I mean, I'm gonna speculate a little bit here before we where I keep going on with another quote here. Um, maybe something like a backpacking tent might be B level Vanu, maybe. But remember, like tents are flimsy. So it's great for mobility, I suppose, but come on. I mean, if you were physically attacked, you pretty much just need a knife. You know, stick the thing in, rip. I mean, that's what the cops did in, um, I think it was like two years ago in some of those cities where there were like homeless people camped out, and there was actually footage by local mainstream media capturing it. That's all the cops say. They just took knives and just shredded the tents, okay? So, right, Such I mean— Such a you'll... dick move. God. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, but hey, that, that's like that, that. That'd be the equivalent of like, like I, I, I'm in my house. It'd be the equivalent to you know, just you know, the state agents like just dropping a napalm on it or something. Like, I, <laughs> yeah, pretty like, much. I don't, I don't know. Like, it would its use value would be deteriorated. I mean, you can't sleep in a tent that's you know has no sides on it. If it's not a tent right. at that point, right? God, that's such a dick move. Well, yeah, but that's how the okay. But to go on a philosophical rant just for a moment here, that's basically the state. It basically destroys the products that were developed by the free market. OK, so when you see cops take the knives and ripping the homeless people's uh, tents, that's, you know, the sorry, folks, the system is not broken. The minarchists were actually wrong about something. The system is not broken. The system is working exactly as it was intended to. And maybe some of the founding fathers were a little naive in thinking that, well, maybe if we do things a little bit differently this time in an historical sense, maybe we'll, it'll turn out with a, with a different result. But we don't know that for certain. We'll just call it the great experiment in limited government and see how it goes. Again, discussion for another time as far as you know, the limited government thing goes. But it's just, it's just – but this is the reality of it. You know, The cops take knives and just rip open the tents. And so the value of tents as a Vanu shelter in terms of B-level Vanu is really, really in terms of mobility and, of course, very, very low activity, right? I mean, Boy Scouts can set up tents, you know, like that. I mean, we're talking, what, five, ten minutes no longer? And that's if you're going a little bit slower? I mean, depending on the complexity. I mean, like, if it's two, like a two-person tent takes up a little longer to set up than just a one-person bivy, okay? Not to get too technical. Um you know, one person bivvies are essentially like a sleeve for for a sleeping bag with a little headroom. Um, you know, this it's not a lot of space. It's actually barely a shelter at that point. Um, but yeah, man, I, it's just the Vanu shelters, the the pretty the typical ones we're thinking of are really sea level that are you know a van, a sailboat, you know something like that where it's mobile. Um, yeah, but let's keep on going here. So, quote, the liberated home free man, unlike the conventionally living libertarian, can segregate import-export from the rest of his life, essential for development of durable, growing, joyous, free mini-cultures, close quote. Uh, he, he put that a lot better than I did a moment ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and really, I mean, the durable, growing, joyous, free mini-cultures, I mean, that's – I mean, those are your those are your autonomous zones, whether temporary or permanent. I mean, that's what what some people would call the second realm, as well. I mean, I mean, whatever whatever label you want to put on it, we're we're basically using different terms to describe more or less kind of the same type of thing. I mean, the, the agora, too, the agora, as the agorist would put it. That then you know, think about it, durable, growing, joyous, free mini cultures. That's that's the agora too. So whatever label we're putting on it, we're kind of trying to describe. A different way of being that has nothing to do and is separate from white market jobs and the income tax and the imperialistic wars of aggression and the police state and 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 you know fill in you know your your own grievances here, you know some sort you know where where people can actually genuinely be free. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> no, I, I certainly agree because I mean, how can you? You know, especially with, uh, um, you know, uh, like uh, the second realm. I think the second realm is better than the uh, saying, is it, uh, oh, who, who was it, um, um, you know, build the uh, build the new society than the show of the old. Um, yeah, those are the syndicalists, so, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think that's, that's I, I like the saying, but um, I, I think the way that, that Rayo puts it is a lot better. Because if you, if you do, if you try to create that new society within the show of the old, inside of the old society, uh, you're going to be beaten down. It's going to be a lot harder, right? Um, yeah. So I think having that that separation uh, is is absolutely crucial. Because if you're getting beat down all the time, your people are getting tossed in prison. Uh, it's gonna be just it's gonna be disheartening, and it's uh, going to you know uh, you know set back uh, you know that invulnerability coercion uh, in that Vani mini culture. 
uh, you know, that's going to set it back. So, yeah, I think it's it's absolutely crucial that these things kind of remain separate. Yeah, one more comment I'll make here before going on to the next quote. You know, um, I know some of the ANCAPs and voluntarists uh, for a while had, had the, the silly, more politically crusading debates on the uh, on the borders debates, even though there's no border because they're not even addressing the real issues there, uh, like the Texan ranchers and such, whose private property abuts the Rio Grande and so forth. You know, I was just thinking, like, if they wanted a real debate on, on border issues or at least more strategic thinking – why aren't they talking about, you know, more of this kind of stuff that, that we are about, you know, like were the syndicalists right about building you know, a new society from the sh within the shell of the old? Or, you know, is it worth building, you know, uh, the infrastructure for a second realm where are there are real private property borders? Um, or, you know, or, or versions on a theme thereof. I mean, heck, if there is going to be the beginning of a second realm, the beginning of the second realm would have to start with Vanu shelters, with people's homes. At least I think so. Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly agree. You know, I, you know, I, I, I think Ray was, was certainly correct. And, you know, the Vanu home base is the first step. That's the, that's the foundational kind of, uh, uh, that's, that's kind of the foundational material. It's kind of a, I mean, it's it's kind of a joke. Like if you're gonna, if you're coming to, you know, anarcho capitalism, I mean, you you read Mises, then you read Rothbard. Uh, you might read some Konkin, although Konkin's not very favored within ANCAP circles now, it seems. Um, but there, there's kind of that, there, there's kind of that, um, uh, you know, that that kind of, you know, that building blocks. And you get into the more of the, uh, you know, once you once you kind of sift through that material, you might jump back to Etienne de la Boetti, you might do some Gustave de Molinari, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, you know, volume home bases are. Like that that foundational thing. I mean, you, you can't you, you've really I mean, I'm not going to say you can't, but I, I just can't I just can't see it, uh, you know, that that invulnerability to coercion progressing without having that secured volume home base. I just can't, I just don't see it. Right. And even and even with like higher level MTH, whether um, I might I might be getting this slightly out of order, but whether it's the D level, E level, F level uh, Vanu and the increased MTH thereof, where at that point you're kind of getting along the lines of having something resembling, resembling an alternate economy, a real agora. Well, it's like, okay, it would be nice to get to that point, but again, if you can't, I know I've said this many times before, folks, but if you can't uh, walk in a straight line, why should I expect you to run a marathon? So in a similar way, yeah, we should have an agora. We can, we should have a second realm. We should have our own private property borders and so forth. But in order to have a functional marketplace invulnerable to the co to coercion by the state, maybe just maybe we should like you know take baby steps and have Vanu shelters first, and then right, right, because, because yeah, because if if you can't uh, you know secure a Vanu home base, then you know I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna trust your capabilities to uh, you know secure a uh, uh, you know uh, some sort of a, a massive operation such as uh, uh, what was it called in uh, in Alongside Night uh, Aurora. Like if you can't if you can't if you can't uh, you know secure your Vanu home base, I'm not gonna trust you to set up uh, set up uh, uh, Aurora. Just not gonna happen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly, and that and that's before getting into like the really risky like or the excuse me the more riskier stuff like uh, the ethical enclaves at least at least to some extent. Of course, the the water version of it and the minimalist sailboating that's kind of its own separate thing, right? But if we're doing the ethical enclaves on land, then yeah, it's kind of like you have to do one foot in front of the other, and you know if you're not going to if you're not even going to set up a Vanu shelter, then why should I expect an alternate economy or an agora of, of anything real, right? And then, of course, not to go too long about this, but like the I've I've noticed, Shane, maybe you have too, that some of the rhetoric by some of our friendly and not so friendly competitors is now shifted towards like private cities and such. A lot of the agoras now are kind of doing that, and it's like, okay, well, again, earlier this season we've explained kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly of free ports, uh, free isles, and private cities, and so forth. And it's like, okay, so they're looking at that, which I guess might be better than the old-fashioned political crusading, but then it's like, okay, but then why are they not talking about Vanu shelters? Or even a second realm more generally, you see? Um, I, I very much think there's a sequence of events here that they're completely ignoring. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think they've uh, <laughs> they haven't uh, you know thought about how to uh, you know uh, change that allodial title to uh, uh, what's the uh, uh, or the, the fee simple yeah. the fee simple fee land simple. to allodial yeah. title yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. 
They're, they're not. I mean, basically, you know, okay, before I go to the next one, I won't make one more comment. You know what it's like, what some of our competitors are doing, Shane, in the alternative media? It's like what they're doing is that they want to jump to, like, let's say, H-level Vanu or thereabouts. Essentially, more or less something along the lines of either a uh, hidden factory or actually, more accurately, a submarine like we've talked about before, it's like they want to jump ahead to that, but then they don't want to bother with, you know, a van or a sailboat or some of the stuff that's actually like much more easily achievable, right? It's like they want to they want to jump ahead to the really sophisticated. They, they, they want to really jump nice toward, They just want to jump to the free society is what they want to do, and it doesn't work out like that, guys. It just doesn't. No. It, 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 there's no possible way that it's going to work out like that. Uh, it's just going to you know turn out to be a lot of you know wasted uh, you know time, money, and effort. And uh, then, you know, uh, I mean, during that time, you could have, you know, had a volume home base. You could have, uh, you know, had your sailboat, whatever you decide to do. I mean, I mean, you, you could have already been working towards that. Uh, it's, it's very much, uh, you know, like uh, when, when you're, uh, you know, teaching yourself something, you can't start like if you're teaching yourself math, uh, you, you start at like, uh, you know, pre-algebra. You don't start at, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, at uh, like a. Uh, like a mathematics for engineering. You just don't do that. You've got to kind of work your way up. And that's kind of the same thing here. Yeah, and as much as I as much as I kind of hate to say this, I personally think that the off-grid homesteaders and some of the preppers and survivalists too are actually much closer to uh, the ANCAP, whatever the heck, uh, quasi utopia thing, than many of I would even say even some of the agorists pushing for private uh, cities, honestly, because the one is like this theoretical fluff which if certain practical things were in place would be much more practical as opposed to the off-grid homesteaders who are who some of their homesteads could be vanu shelters actually like today arguably because i mean they because they've they've set up like security perimeters and such that actually blend into the environment actually do keep uh, predators and, and cops and whatever else out. So, you know, that's kind of very interesting, isn't it? When different people trying different things um, and then some of them, let's say, having the courage of their convictions versus some who don't. And it's very interesting to see what the results have been, at least thus far. So yeah, it's yeah. just because yeah. people and not and not to men not to mention as well. So say say it, something does come into fruition, like uh, you know what they're looking for. Like we'll use Libertopia. Is it uh, Libertopia or uh, li uh, why can't I remember? Liberland. Liberland. Oh like, so, yeah. So they had their like they had their you know private city or they their new their new libertarian nation, and because you know they started with that, they didn't you know work up to the other other portions of it. Um, now you know they have it, but it's not working. Like it, there's a, there's a lot of obstacles that have to be overcome. And, uh, you know, they're doing it with, you know, limited infrastructure, limited money. I mean, when, and without even, you know, clear property, you know, ownership there. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very distorted. So even if something like that does come into fruition, uh, you know, if they, you know, jump through the first five or six steps uh, and, you know, they get their private city. Well, uh, you know, have you, uh, you know, focused on defense? Have you, have you learned? Have you, has your competency increased uh, with the, the activity that you're pursuing? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. And I think it'll be, it'll be a uh, short lived, much like. With the uh, the case studies in libertarian nations, uh, they jump straight to that, and I think that's a major factor why those failed. Um, I, I I really do. Yeah. So so whether there's uh, many of our listeners, whether they consider themselves agorists, whether they consider themselves Venuans, as a, you know as I'm as I'm trying to do, or 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 something, uh, uh, let's say compat compatibly friendly. Um, the the point is, I think I'll, I think a lot of us. Collect, you know, not not to invoke collective movementism, though. Uh, I think a lot of us really need to have a lot more humility about what's possible today, and what's also likely to develop in the future within certain different time spans, right? Ten years versus twenty years versus thirty years, based on certain assumptions. So, in other words, yeah, I mean, Shane, I don't know about you, but I can totally see people developing Vanu shelters that are very mobile. Within five years, if people, you know, like, like li listen to these episodes, read the materials and, and actually act in our, in our lives. I totally see this as like the five year non plan, non centralized plan. Literally, well, you know, I have five plan, like, you know, like, especially for kind of like, you know, A through C level Vanu or yeah. even, even even some A through D, um, you know, kind of like the, uh, you know, like the tiny, like a tiny house, you know, permanent yeah. autonomous zone. I can yeah. even see, you know, just a couple of years, you know, that could that could come into fruition, depending upon how committed somebody was to bring bring it into uh, uh, into existence.
We'll speak about the tiny home thing for a second. That's already caught on. I mean, that's a big thing like how van dwelling is right now. And that's a good thing. So actually, the the time span actually could be a lot shorter, maybe even two years. Well, with the main distinction being, okay, so people are familiar with the tiny houses as well as the people who are van dwelling. Some people try to do both, which is interesting. And that's an interesting avenue uh, that's maybe more appropriate for season three in terms of combining different things. Uh, but yeah, I mean, think about it. So if they just had better security... If they also did it in such a way to in, in the in the context of like one directional isolationism and so forth, I think they could be a lot freer than they already are, you know, like that. So that's kind of something I don't think a lot of people have considered that maybe there is actually a philosophical component to some of these practical uh, methods and that there's also a lot of um, practical methods. And, 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 you know, and let me put it this way, there's philosophy and then there's practicality. One, if things are going to be consistent, things have to be in one as in the other and vice versa. You know, uh, function, yeah. as Rayo himself said, function determines form, means determine ends. You know, how you go about achieving something is just as important as what that particular end happens to be. And so regarding the Vanu shelters, yeah, um, maybe maybe some, some of our, uh, you know, friendly and not so friendly competitors in the alternative media really need to dial down the rhetoric on private cities and dial up – uh, the rhetoric on, um, I would say, a combination of some of our like la latest episodes, like on the van nomads and the minimalist sailboating, uh, the Vanu shelters, like this episode and such. So sorry, I didn't mean to go off on that tangent too much, but I think it is related to the Vanu shelters because this is the place to start, I think, in terms of, you know, get your home and hearth, you know, get your own households in order. You know, stop trying to change the world. I, I You've heard that rhetoric over the years, right, Shane? You know, yeah, we have yeah, to change changing, the world. changing, yeah, changing society into you know this uh, this proprietarian anarchist. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, yeah, it's it, yeah, yeah. That's 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 why collective movementism fails. It's trying to change, like it's, it's it's trying to change everyone else. When you know, I mean, I mean, yeah, we we are fallible. Like we are like I, I'm a okay. Let me just put it this way. I'm a fallible human being, right. and uh, therefore, why the hell is anyone gonna listen to me uh, when I told them this is the way they should live, they should live their life? You know, I'd rather live by example and then just uh, you know have them have them come afterwards, but. Uh, but yeah, changing society as a whole, yeah, that doesn't no. that doesn't work. That doesn't work. No, and 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 as a friendly, maybe not counterpoint, but both parallel to that. Remember also what Konkin mentioned, New Libertarian Manifesto, where you have different people offering different strategies, and they compete in the marketplace, offering you know strategy A, strategy B, strategy C, and then people kind of make choices about which particular you know methods and strategies work for them, and so forth. And so uh, podcasts like these. Uh, and so forth. But we're we're just presenting different options that we're trying that I believe are philosophically consistent. At least I, I would like to think so. But ultimately, that's going to be up to the listener to make their own value judgments as far as that goes. Uh, but yeah, regarding the Vanu shelters, um, yeah, I mean they got to have better security um, <laughs> than just these uh, some of these. I mean Shane, sorry, sorry. One more tangent. The some structures I've noticed that are usually like white market approved in the servile society that meet all the building codes and all that. I'm sorry, dude. Why do people think regulations work? I mean, some of these structures, even right here in Austin, are so friggin' flimsy. I even joked with somebody who she admits she's a socialist along the lines of like a Bernie Sanders type. And even as a socialist, she admits that she lives in basically like a twig house, essentially, that like if it rains a little too much, her roof leaks kind of thing. So it's like I'm not really understanding why, why people are getting excited about this kind of thing or make assumptions that regulations solve anything. Um, the fact of the matter is that her roof is leaking. Well, Kyle, it's the 21st century, and people shouldn't be living in fucking squalor. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but yeah, that that's kind of the – that's kind of the <laughs> – uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of the the attitude, the the general attitude. And actually, there was a a listener uh, today, July twenty fifth, actually uh, tagged me in, in an article, and it was this lady who um was you know talking about her van nomadism experiences. It's not what she called it; she called it van dwelling, I think. But uh, anyways, she the and the, the article was pretty much, I mean, she she talked about why why she got into it and uh you know uh, and that sort of thing. But the, most of the article was literally just about that. Uh, it just consisted of you know like I've had my uh. I've had I had a note put on my uh, on my van telling me to get out. Uh, you know I didn't, and I the next morning I woke up with my tires flat and my you know window shattered. What? Uh, and like she was just being like she was harassed constantly, uh, and and she had you know obviously the cops calling on her and uh, and just all sorts of stuff like that. So I mean yeah that's um, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, they, it's uh, it, it's either, you know, I think you mentioned in that Van Nomadism episode, it might just be, you know, kind of jealousy, like, oh, this person isn't tied to, this person isn't tied to a rent like I am, they aren't, yeah. uh, they aren't paying property taxes, uh, or there's also just kind of the counter, the, the counter, I guess, the counterpoint or counter, I guess, option is that, you know, it's quite possible, and actually in some instances it definitely is this, but you know, people have this this sort of perception of what 20, 21st century, you know, uh, America should look like, and uh, living in squalor in a van is not that. Uh, so it's it's kind of the, the perception of the state of survival society too. Uh, even the slaves don't want their you know their 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 fellow uh, their fellow man uh, to be free. They just can't have it. If they can't be free, then they don't want anyone to be free. Right, and um, you know, and sorry, two things real quickly. One. I think it's uh, rather fascinating that, yeah, the general perception by the Servile Society, and definitely here in Austin, I can say double and triple this, is that everybody deserves to live in a big McMansion. And actually, they've been building developments uh, not too far from where I'm at, which if we increase property values, uh, at least to some degree, but more importantly, increase the property taxes. And uh, even the county government where I'm at is... Uh, they've been mentioning... Uh, I've, I've got a friend who actually keeps an eye on more of the local government shit, in more in the context of like trying to see if anything bad is coming down the pike and yeah property taxes are going to go up next year noticeably because of the oh, developments of and of course those developers and i did get this confirmed last week from my contact apparently uh yeah those developers they're getting subsidies from the county government so that's a little uh, there's some course. fascism there's some fascism right there again no federal government involved at all that i can that i know for certain but what is provable is that the county government basically gave subsidies to this development corporation. So even the leftists should agree with me on this. So these uh, these corporate uh, developers uh, got subsidies from the county government uh, in order to build these developments. And then, of course, in return, the property values go up, the property taxes go up. And, of course, who gets the property tax? Well, the county government. Yeah, you see how that works. So that's kind of um, – yeah, so fascism is still very much alive and well, but of course the conservatives will call it free market, but then again, they don't understand how free markets work. Different discussion for another time, just forget uh. I mentioned it in passing. So in terms of where you set up your Vanu shelter, yeah, you may not necessarily want to tie it to private land for reasons that we've gone into a little bit here, but also in that uh, previous episode earlier this season on private land and um, whatever that topic was for that same episode as well. Yeah, and I guess what, one other one other thing, and it's it's going to be kind of reinforcing what you just said. Yeah, uh, as far as as far as where you decide to to put your Vanu home base. Uh, or to you know set one up, uh, or you know the multiple locations to set it up. Uh, you know I mentioned this in my volume presentation, or at least maybe, maybe I can't remember what I actually said in the actual presentation and what was in practice, but I think I said something along the lines of, uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> obviously Rayo did what he did. Uh, you know, with his Vanu home bases. Uh, but as far as, and we still have to develop Vanu in cities, but, uh, you know, I, I really think, you know, that the most efficacious strategies, uh, you know, for, you know, setting up a Vanu home base are mobile, obviously the van and the sailboat, uh, I think are two, you know, very, very good possibilities. Uh, but, you know, I, I just don't see... <sighs> I don't know. We'll have to develop monument cities, but where you, yeah, where you decide to do this is very, very important. Uh, if you're in a city, you're gonna have to deal with more shit than you would have to if uh, you're in a rural area. Maybe, debatably, right? Uh, depending upon, uh, you know, all other things being equal. Yeah. Um. So it, that, that is that is definitely definitely huge. Just as just as you were you would do for. Uh, and, and hell, you might have to st uh, strategically, re or st strategically relocate uh, to, you know, get your Vanu shelter set up. Um, so, I mean, maybe kind of the same considerations that would go into play for that. Uh, only in addition, uh, maybe look at, uh, you know, obviously like the, the deception, you know, kind of the concealment and all that stuff that goes into it. Because, uh, yeah, wh where you decide to set up that Vanu home base is absolutely crucial. Because uh, if it doesn't make you more invulnerable to coercion, it's not a bonding home base. It's something else. <laughs> right. And uh, sorry, one other thing I wanted to add before we get on to the next quote. Uh, regarding the, uh, the the lady you just mentioned with her tires getting slashed and her windows getting mm -hmm. broken. You know, in terms of improving security on, on vans, I mean, maybe there's an avenue for maybe having slash-proof tires and or having some um, like security film or like safety film. Uh, like put on the window so even when they d like next time or for just somebody else they attack somebody the damage can at least be minimized so at least the car is still functional and it doesn't look like it just got raided you know broken glass and slashed tires yeah just saying just saying yeah yeah 
Okay, so let's uh, let's continue on here. So uh, I believe it was earlier this uh, season, the season two of ours, we discussed uh, secured communicators, and I think it was the episode on crypto anarchism more specifically. Correct. Yeah, and I think it might have come up in ethical enclaves too. But yeah, the the most recent one was certainly the crypto the marriage of uh, uh, crypto anarchism, marriage of security culture and Bonu. Yeah. Right. And there's a relevant quote here regarding the Vanu shelters, uh, but in the context of the secure communicators, of course, uh, quote, and most of those who lack Vanu shelter will be sufficiently intimidated to abstain from using gold or secure communicators. So Vanu shelter is a crucial prerequisite for substantial Vanu trade, close quote. Now, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because that kind of reinforces some stuff we've already mentioned, at least to some degree, right? That... It's kind of like the old notion about like emergent technologies, um, or, or excuse me, pre-existing technologies uh, per, en enable emergent technologies, right? So uh, you know, stuff of uh, <laughs> like think about like uh, computers and the internet, right? That form of technology actually enables other forms of technology that weren't previously available, and so it's kind of something roughly similar here. When you have a Vanu shelter it can actually enable the development of a so-called uh, alternate economy or let sh or can I dare shall I say Shane the actual agora right you know right I, yeah yeah an unregulated unlicensed uh, unta non-taxed laissez-faire freed market uh, yeah, I think the Vanu shelter would be the crucial prerequisite for an agora quite frankly so uh, for those of you who are uh, agorists is it agorists or agorists? I don't know. I've heard both. I, 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 I agorists. That's what Sam said in that uh, debate. So, yeah. Agor agorists. Okay, we'll go with that. Yeah. Agorists, okay. agorism, yeah. So, so for the agorists, um, if you guys really want to develop the agora, you know, because you guys are trying to starve the state and then smash it later, uh, you know, kudos to you guys. I'm just simply uh, suggesting kind of as, you know, the friendly over here that maybe you guys should focus your efforts more on developing Vanu shelters than promoting private cities. You know, just saying. Because the Vanu shelter is the crucial prerequisite for, I think, an Agora. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. You know, I, I, I think Agorism is great, uh, obviously, you know, uh, even if it's just for, you know, kind of that financial independence a a avenue. Uh, you know, I think it's great for that reason, but, uh, you know, I think there's, you know, I, I think, you know, as, as I said in that article and, and as, as we kind of talked about, you know, I think, a, you know, agorism and, and Vani, you know, complement each other very, very nicely. Uh, so, you know, for those who, if you're an agorist and you're still listening to this, if this is your first time listening, I mean, listen to the entire, the entire, you know, series, I highly recommend it. Um, but I, I really do think, you know, if, if the focus shifted rather than from, or I, I guess, I, actually, I guess... Nowadays, it seems like most folks practice agorism because it improves their situation. You know, if they don't pay taxes, you know, that makes that has gives them more money to spend. Yeah, child um, necessity and all that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I think the focus is less on you know smashing the state now. I think that was obviously the the the, the goal. Uh, but I think if that goal is going to be achieved, uh, it's going to take uh, you know getting those fondue shelters you know um, put up where you're in where you're as invulnerable to coercion as you possibly can uh, can be, and then you know building that fondue mini culture. And then having a bunch of those Vanu mini cultures, um, and then to the point where it kind of takes over society, which is not going to happen, I don't think. But uh, I think there's a there's a better strategy there, and I think Vanu, uh, you know, um, incorporating that into agorism might be a, uh, a wise thing to do. Uh, but then again, it's already implemented, right? It's uh, at the Enclaves. Yes, and so for folks who want to learn more about agorism and more kind of the rule, I would say pretty much more importantly, the relationship between Vanu and, and agorism, please listen to our previous season two episode on ethical enclaves for all the 20 million different details and how all that goes together. But in context of the Vanu shelters, I would really say, yeah, if you want to have an ethical enclave, if you want to go be uh, an, an agorist and actually help set up the uh, agora, or, or some version thereof, or an element thereof, or dare shall I say an industry thereof, but I mean industry in a good way, like, like, a, like a particular field, uh, then yeah, I, I, would, I would suggest that the Vanu Shelter is kind of the place to start. And that goes, and by the way, that goes double and triple if you're going to go the black market route. Like gray market is one thing, but if you're going to go black market, I would say the Vanu Shelter is actually going to be more important than not because you're automatically now at or arguably you're, you're automatically at more risk if you go black market versus gray market. 
Um, of course, there are people, there are agorists who do both gray and black markets just because it's more profitable for them. But again, in, in the interest of keeping people out of prison, um, yeah, the Vanu shelter is, I, I think that's just, I think that's just good security culture, quite frankly. Right. No, I, I, I certainly agree. All right. And uh, for our next quote, quote, shelter, shelter development is still our biggest activity. Our situation the past year, Vanu, Comfort, Convenience, Winter, we can have any three of the four, but not all four at once, i.e. we can live in Vanu and Comfort with convenience, but not in winter. We can be comfortable in Vanu during winter if we forego convenience to do many things, etc. Close quote. So I think, Shane, that particular quote by Rayo came from, I think it was Report on Progress and Problems, wasn't it? Correct, correct. And uh, yeah, and what, what he's talking about here is there's one, one uh, I, I guess it, it probably was that same chapter, if I remember correctly, but uh, he, uh, he talked about how uh, when it was extremely cold out, uh, you know, pretty much all him and uh, Roberta and Naomi or Halen, you know, just choose your name this week, uh, you know, uh, you know, they, you know, pretty much just stayed in the foam hut all day and they couldn't really do anything. Um, so if we're going convenience to actually, you know, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, writing a new article on the typewriter or whether it's, uh, you know, get going and gathering wood for, uh, you know, maybe their uh, wood burning stove or whatever it is. A lot of that stuff was just kind of put on hold uh, because uh, once they left that foam hut, it was uh, it was game over there uh, in the winter in Siskiyou. Right. So I, I think something to be kind of taken away here and the reason we're not going to go into the uh, 20 million different technical details on the different structures is that. It's pretty much it was it was a lot and Shane, correct me on this. I think Rayo was giving very detailed, uh, det well details things like you know so many you know cut this length to so many yards. It was like almost like reading an instruction manual, wasn't it? Yeah, it it'd be uh, yeah. So, so we decided not to uh, yeah not to <laughs> read that entire chapter here. It'd be very very dry. I don't think it'd be very entertaining for a podcast. But uh, you know what I will say is if if you are considering wilderness fauna. Uh, or you know even van nomadism. I mean, I, I still think that's kind of uh, valuable because it's it's gonna it's gonna be relatable. Because uh, I remember one of the articles on van nomadism. He said uh, the the guy said you know in winter, uh, you know it's still hard to stay warm. So uh, you might be able to glean some uh, some some input from that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's very very dry material and yeah, it's pretty it's pretty much how to. It's not as technical as um, the articles in this new Vonnie Life edition, but they are still pretty technical and dr it's dry and uh, and yeah, if you're pursuing that 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 uh, portion of Vonnie, then yeah, I definitely recommend it. But for for those interested in other things, uh, yeah, maybe you know as as far as you know kind of what 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 Rayo you know looked into or I guess what he wrote about what he's I guess his report on progress might be beneficial to you. Uh, still recommend you read it, but. Uh, but yeah, it'd be yeah, too dry and not very entertaining for a podcast. Let me just provide a counterpoint before going on to the to the next quote, which is simply this: If you listeners give us enough, uh, you know, give us enough proof of market demand, and you demand it, um, what I would suggest is uh, if there is enough market demand for it, maybe we could make a mini series as part of season three, where literally each one of those different structures that Rayo was experimenting with, like the polyethylene A tent, um, the foam hut, maybe that ply new thing, whatever those underground structures were, I guess like makeshift bunkers, I suppose, and whatever the versions are of, like each one of those could be a different episode in a mini series as part of season three, where we could go through the technical details, but only if you listeners really want us to. So again, yeah, and my I, and I did and, and I did I actually thought about this, uh, you know, when I was actually transcribing uh, some of some of it today. Uh, you know, I actually considered. I mean, the materials aren't expensive. I probably got. I probably got. You know, many of them down there at, at the ground already. Um, you know, I, I might actually. You know, for season three. You know, once the. You know, once I. I could justify it. You know, like once the costs are covered, because you know I got my own stuff to pay for, guys. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. One. You know, if the costs are covered and there's demand for it, you know, I will actually. You know, do like a a video tutorial. Uh, you know, because we've got the guides now, the how-tos, exactly like the tutorials on how to do it. So, uh, you know, we could actually see what, you know, radio structure kind of looked like. Uh, that one, uh, there's also the uh, the shoe swap, I think he called it uh, the uh, pluma or plima or whatever it was called. But yeah, there, there are a couple structures you talked about, and I think it'd be fun to actually, you know, um, build one of those things. Uh, so yeah, for season three, I mean, I wouldn't be adverse to doing that at all. I'd get down to the ground and, you know, I'd have a reason to go down there again, right? Uh, and you actually just build those structures. Uh, so I think that'd be that'd be a lot of fun if there's demand for it. Uh, so so yeah, let us know. Let us know. Yeah, then and I'm really I'm really pleased to hear uh, that 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 potential offer, Shane, on 
the video tutorials because that would be something very visual that people could see that, hey, this isn't just like abstract stuff we're talking about here. There actually is a practical application as well. Uh, so yeah, folks, my email is kyle at vanupodcast.com or for Shane, Shane at vanupodcast.com. Let us know, email us, let us know if you want detailed, really detailed, like almost instructional material, uh, you know, kind of stuff. Maybe not as boring as an instruction booklet. We'll try to make it, uh, you know, enjoyable and such, but, but still pretty detailed on whether it's the polyethylene A tent, the foam hut, some of the other structures Shane just mentioned, let us know. And if there's enough demand, then yeah, we'll, we'll do some season three episodes on this and it'll probably have to be a mini series because they are kind of interrelated to some degree, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right, but as far as this particular episode goes, this is just more about Vanu shelters in general. So yes, we will not, 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 not be going into, uh, for example, uh, like how many, uh, <laughs> like, oh, just, okay, I will say this, just to give it a flavor. Like at one point, Rayo mentions about like four by six by two feet versus four and a half by nine by two feet when discussing something. Okay, we're not getting into any of that stuff this episode. But if you, but if you want us to, ladies and gentlemen, email us and maybe. We'll do uh, some season three episodes on that. So yeah, just, are, just making uh, the offer. Yeah, since uh, you know, obviously we rely upon market, uh, you know, market feedback. So, uh, uh, so you are you are the masters at this podcast. Obviously, the ultimate decision making will come down to us. But uh, we obviously want to hear from you. And uh, you know, if that's something you want to hear, if if that's what what you want to see uh, or hear, uh, certainly more than happy. To, like I, I don't care what about Vanu it is. I'm happy to talk about any of it. So. Right, right, but 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 just. It's 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 a lot of detail for each one of those type of Vanu shelters, never mind all of them uh, that Rayo uh, mentioned. So that's the only reason we're kind of skipping over the technical details for those uh, different structures in this particular season two episode about Vanu shelters. It's just because there's it's a combination of too much detail, plus it gets very, very technical and dry, just like Shane said. So if you folks do want us to get into the dry technical stuff, it would have to be for season three, and you would have to email us and let us know whether yay or nay, okay? So this one, uh, for once, guys, this is on you listeners, whether this is going to happen or not. So for season three, so I'll, I'll just leave it there, okay? Now, uh, continuing on. Rayo also said, quote, general thought on shelter, build small shelters and have several in an area far enough apart so that discovery of one is not likely to lead to discovery of others. Use soft foot gear such as moccasins lined with foam. Actually, that's a good idea uh, for travel between them and to water sources and latrines to minimize disturbance of ground. Good conservation and Vanu. Use hard foot gear like regular boots only when hiking outside of home area. Advantages of multiple small shelters, hmm. many more suitable sites, easier to put under slash between trees and bushes with little cutting, not as visible. Small structure with few possessions appears less, quote, permanent if discovered, less likely to arouse curiosity or hostility. Disadvantages, travel between them, items not always at hand when wanted, quote. Okay, Shane, I like that quote for so many reasons. So Same how about here. you how about you take a first swing at it and then I'll I'll, I'll hop on it. Sure, sure. So uh, so I actually I, I'm actually catching up on on The Walking Dead, uh, you know, the TV show. Uh, you know, I like watching the survival ones even if they're un unrealistic as all hell. Um, but but, but uh, I, I was watching it. Now anytime I watch anything, it's it's from the eyes of real. like it's it's kind of, you know, in the context of mine because it's always on my mind. Uh, but what I what I would re recommend for the listeners like any of those sort of survival shows like The Walking Dead or Jericho or something like that, just um you know, watch, like watch those and just kind of you know try to think through the eyes of Rayo. Like, what would he see? Because I remember there was there was one, uh, one instance, and this relates perfectly to this. Uh, but uh, you know the I don't remember what his name is. Uh, um, yeah, I don't remember. Um, but uh, he he was uh, he was walking and he hopped on a horse. And uh, I immediately thought, I was like, damn, but he had better, not, had better hope he's not getting tracked. And you're sure enough, the next cut scene, you know, there's a guy looking down at the track, just following him. It's like, okay, well, oh. you know, I wouldn't have noticed that before. Um, so, so, so that's, that, that observation is, is extremely, extremely important. Uh, you know, uh, using soft foot gear when you're in the home camp area. Uh, and then when you're outside of the home, home camp area, it doesn't really matter as much. Um, but that sort of, that, like a mistake like that could get you found out. So um, to be conscious of that, uh, I think, is uh, extremely, extremely important because the point is um, there, there's an article in Bonnie Life, March 1973, and it's um, 
It's a, a ecology Vanu. Uh, it's a, it's it's a picture. It's not actually a title, but it's uh, like ecology ecology to Vanu, technology to Vanu, technology to ecology, Vanu to peace, and then Vanu to ecology. And uh, and as 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 a Vanu, and I mean you know, whether it's uh, you know out of kind of that environmental aspect or you know just out of the you know we don't want anyone to know that we were here. Um, you want to leave the land as unaltered as possible. Um, so I, I think that's a very good observation that he had. Uh, you know as as far as you know uh, increasing the MTH. Yeah, um, and and sorry, I know we I know we've mentioned this earlier this episode and on previous episodes. I'm going to mention it again because it's directly related to this particular quote. When it comes to mean time to harassment, there's a reason why it's best to start with a level Vanu and then develop and then kind of develop your skills from there. One of the things you learn when you're doing B level Vanu, basically essentially being a backpacker, is that you learn very quickly about. Uh, what interestingly enough the boy scouts of america would call like leave no trace uh where essentially you're very sensitive about well like okay like back during my boy scout days you know it, we we all wore boots usually lightweight hiking boots and we we're very sensitive about leaving uh well an impact on the ground because gaia or whatever um but the point was, like, for example, if we're work walking on structures where – or it's not structures, excuse me. If we're walking on types of materials and, and sur surfaces, excuse me, if we're walking on types of surfaces that we, do, we don't really change just by putting our boots on it, then that's very different from surfaces where we do leave uh, boot prints. And, of course, part of le <clears throat> part of leave no traces don't leave – is don't leave, you know, the boot prints and so forth. So, for example, uh, walking on rocks, walking on well-beaten paths, walking on uh, really basically those kind of hard surfaces where you're not going to leave a boot print uh, is a good thing. And generally speaking, you try to stay away from like mud uh, where you do leave boot uh, boot prints. Uh, you don't try to walk on uh, types of surfaces that would increase like soil erosion, especially like in or near trails, like hiking trails. And just and there's all sorts of other types of services where basically you're disturbing the local ecology. Um, some of the uh, eco-fascists and like you know lefty types would say things like, uh, "Well, we need to leave the pristine wilderness pristine because you know man is like a virus on the earth or whatever." Because basically they're closeted eugenicists. Discussion for another time. Uh, but suffice it to say, I do partially agree, at least in the context of if you actually use a boot to place your weight on uh, those types of services, you will leave a mark. And that's true, you do. Now, whether that's good or bad is a completely, that's a value judgment, right? But it's still a fact that on some of those types of services that are more ply pliable, um, you do leave a mark. I mean, what, the average adult uh, weighs what, 140, 50 pounds or, or more? There so, about something somewhere in that range. Yeah, some some people have said it's you know oh the average American's two hundred pounds. Yuck yuck yuck. Right? You know maybe make a reference to the alleged obesity epidemic, which of course is only possible because of the corn so, subsidies. But that's a discussion for the, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. Which which is which is caused in large part by the corn subsidies. But again, that too is a discussion for another time because that's getting into more why why this why the system is why why the way it is and why we're trying to get away from it at least at least with our one directional isolationism and whatever else. So regarding the tracking issue, yeah, I mean, a lot of things can leave tracks in soil or, or whatever your surfaces are. So whether it's a boot print, like shoe print, whether it's a uh, horse, you were mentioning the example of like the horse, the horse hooves mm -hmm. or, the, or the horseshoes or whatever. Um, actually, tire treads, too. Tire tread. I mean, you park a van like in mud and then you roll away assuming you know you don't get get it stuck in a sinkhole right that's actually happened to some people um yeah you're you're leaving tire treads behind or the imprint of it in the mud especially if and that's and that's why rayo you know they, they park the van far away from where yeah. they're camping yeah not well, even actually close. yeah and there that's that's very wise to do and sorry one thing i just thought of um you know if you like park in mud or you even travel through mud, um, and then if the weather changes not long after, and so you go from kind of this this it's, kind of it gets wet cemented mushy, in there, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah that's right. Is there? Yeah. Right. And so in that dried mud, that's like the natural version of like using like a okay, this is getting a little technical, but like a plaster of Paris, like what the CSI like forensics guys type guys do, the real ones, not the stupid TV show crap, which basically is sci bad sci-fi. But like what the actual like forensics guys do, where they use plaster of Paris to basically take an imprint, an artificial imprint of like a suspect's uh, a shoe print. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, this stuff is real, okay? So in terms of not accidentally leaving uh, a trace behind, so to speak, then yeah, just be sensitive about the, the types of services uh, you're traveling on, whether by uh, foot, horse, or car, or whatever else that would potentially leave behind a trail. So what Rayo was saying here in this quote was more about feet, right? Use the soft foot gear such as the moccasins and uh, like on, on certain uh, types of services or whatever, and especially like in camp was the context here, right? Uh, as opposed to the, what do you call the hard foot gear when you're, you know, as you said, hiking outside the home area or the regular boots. Yeah, there, and see, that's interesting too because if you're like in camp, so again, let's assume B-level Vanu here in terms of MTH. If you're in camp, then yeah, I mean, heck, it's actually normal backpacking practice, Shane, that after you've been like hiking the day in your boots, that you take off your boots and you wear your secondary pair of uh, foot gear, whatever that is. Rayo here says moccasins, but there's there's sand. Some people use sandals. Um, there is also a kind of an, a kind of a more obscure type of footwear, not a lot of people really recognize, but something called like um, aqua shoes, where essentially it's like a piece of like f uh, rubber and then like some like not fishnets, but like some type of like spandex type material on it that you could technically like use while swimming. Hence the term aqua shoes. Get it? Mm -hmm. So you can walk in it to some degree, but there's like no arch support or whatever. I don't want to get too technical, but that would count too as soft foot gears. So whether it's like an aqua shoe type thing, a moccasin, sandals, and I want to be absolutely clear in this: not foot flops, please. For goodness sakes, flip flops need to like really go away. Um, I'm still surprised there's people <laughs> who who have a market man for flip flop. No, seriously, like one of my relatives was running in flip-flops one time she tripped on this was on a sidewalk and maybe this wasn't exactly the smartest thing she ever did to be perfectly fair but she like tripped on her flip-flops and she chipped a tooth on the sidewalk that's crazy i wear flip-flops I, I, like i wear yeah just this, i wear you know this this sandals all the time man <laughs> this summer yeah. all yeah, the time so it's it's forget put forget putting on socks i'll just you know toss on some flip-flops i'm going somewhere um yeah so yeah, you know, that, that is yeah the, that is is uh, at the the place I work now. You know, reduced hours obviously, which is fun. Um, but uh, but yeah, they don't allow flip flops because uh, you know people twist their ankles and stuff, and that's bad for you know company insurance. Um, so so yeah, that's a it's that's a very good observation. I wanted to mention this too um, before I forgot it. Um, but you know you know furthermore beyond just um, you know what you wear. Uh, it's also, you know, how you walk, right? Uh, and this is also from the from, from the Walking Dead. And this is only a couple of, couple of few hours ago, but um, but it was actually uh, Carol, the the old lady. Um, and there's this uh, this new guy out there training, and uh, and she was like, oh yeah, and by the way, heel to out, heel toe out here in uh, in the woods. I could hear you coming from a mile away, um, like that sort of thing. And also when you're building the shelter. Um, now, uh, now when we, when we cut logs down in, uh, in Southern Illinois, uh, we'll cut some big ones. They'll make a loud noise when it hits the ground. Probably not advisable. Uh, you know, for uh, since you're trying to keep your noise level down uh, to you know to, to the kind of the environment level, and Rayo talked about that. Uh, but yeah, when you're building your shelter, I think he mentioned he only uses dead trees or ones that are um, are so grouped up that like uh, that like there's like you know five or six trees in like a small group, and one of them's gonna die eventually. He'll, he might cut out that center one or something. Um, but uh, but obviously, if you're if you're dragging back sticks or something, you probably would, wouldn't 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 want to drag it back to camp. That wouldn't be smart. Um, but then also just kind of the noise level. Um, that that you're operating at whenever you're uh, building that shelter. Uh, so just uh, a quick note there. Yeah, yeah, I, I think those are those are definitely things to keep in mind. And one more thing I'll say about this quote before we continue on. Notice how Rayo at one point mentioned about advantages of multiple small shelters. I know I love that to so much that he was even considering that. Well, maybe when it comes to finding shelters, maybe we should also consider the fact that maybe it's not so much. Uh, the singular, maybe what's more important is the plural, as in Vanu shelters, as opposed to a Vanu shelter. And I think the difference is rather quite important in that, well, maybe you should have like more than one. 
Yeah, you know? yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah, I think that's I think that's wise. I think that's wise. Have, well, you know, having it, it's if you have one, you only have one option, right? And it's always good mm-hmm. to have options. Uh, mm-hmm. So you know, if uh, if you're if you're pulling back to one and 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 you see you know bludge over there, you can always just you know you know track back and go to the other one. You're fine. Um, so it's always nice to have options. Right. Well, kind of like how I mentioned in some of our, you know, most recent season two episodes, like whether it was the minimal sailboating, the van nomadism, and so forth, and even just other episodes where we've mentioned just kind of in passing things like the tiny house people or or or, or other types of things people are experimenting with, uh, even right now, is that well, why do you have to have only one uh like 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 home that's mobile or whatever? I mean, why can't you have a tiny house and a van? And a uh, and a sailboat, you see, and have like different combinations of things too. I, I think I brought that up before, and I would say the same thing here in terms of Vanu shelters. Like again, um, if you've been pursuing financial independence already, and and you can obviously afford these things, you know, being you know being responsible in that sense, not like not doing what some people have done and go into debt or get. I think somebody even tried to get like a like a, some sort of like. Uh, mortgage on a tiny house one time which kind of which even the tiny house people didn't like that at all uh, yeah, yeah 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 that actually discussion for another time but it was it was that's it, almost that, that might be worse than the uh, credit card <laughs> preppers because at, at that point like you're, you're stuck there like uh, like you've got a mortgage defeating on the this. purpose of yeah you've, you've got a mortgage on this like oh my god save up for like just save up for like six months or a year and then do it yeah i mean like they, those like you're, it's a small house it's not going to cost that much no, it's not. But see, yeah, that, that's kind of the, the purpose of the thing. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So um, actually, who knows? Maybe that should be a season three episode where people are like doing like the bastardized version of some of the stuff we're talking about. And uh, yeah, what, whether it's, it's a credit titled, card prep- titled what not to do. What maybe maybe that should be a season three episode, folks. Again, let us know. Kyle at uh, vanupodcast.com. Shane at vanupodcast.com. Let us know if we should do a season three episode on like the bastardized versions of 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 some of the stuff we're talking about, whether the credit card prepping, getting a mortgage for a tiny house, like like the complete wrong ways <laughs> of doing some of this kind of stuff. Because I I've I even I've been noticing it too. It's just kind of like wow, really. Um, but hey, you know, people who still need to exorcise the collectivist spooks from their heads, we'll find all sorts of ingenious ways to try to marry some of the stuff we're talking w- about with, with of course, the, the servile society and, and, of course, the state, you know, more specifically, right? Uh, like, how, how can you possibly screw up this otherwise good thing that's going on? It's kind of like Bitcoin, right? Like, how can you screw up Bitcoin? Well, you have the lobbyists go in and basically try to make deals it's with not, the federal it's government. Not, how right? can you screw it? It's, I mean, it's, it's which way <laughs> do you want to screw it up, unfortunately? Yeah, so, so, so maybe we will do an episode on C. Really, like, let let us know, folks. Uh, but again, discussion for another time as far as that goes. But yeah, regarding regarding the Vanu shelters, though, I mean, why not have a network even of of different shelters? That um, actually, Shane, do you remember? I think we mentioned this back in season one. Do you remember what Rayo said? Um, I know, going off the cuff here about like the fleeing liber- libertarian revolutionist, yep. and that Rayo wouldn't be adverse to like basically essentially running on running an underground railroad of sorts such to shelter. Yeah, he might, yeah, he might even be able to uh, put his skills to better use too. Oh yeah, for sure. Right. Well, at least that first part about like like the underground railroad part. Like, well, if you have a network of Vanu shelters, well, <laughs> yeah, that, that's basically your underground. Or it, excuse me. It could be converted even temporarily as uses like a as a de facto uh, underground railroad or whatever. And of course, that's, because that's, that's brilliant, dude. That that is that's honestly brilliant too. Like if you consider, <laughs> um, like like uh, like let's like you just, there's I don't know. We'll just use you know Siski region for example here. But say there's uh you know 15 or 20 of them set up out there, and uh, you know someone gets in trouble. And, uh, you know, they, they contact, you know, the Vanu Association, like, hey, man, I need, I need a place to hide out. It's like, all right, go to, you know, uh, Latitude and Latitude this and Longitude that. So you'll find uh, a safe house there. Uh, there's uh, enough food there to last you a couple of months. And, uh, and, and yeah, like that, that'd be huge. That would have, yeah, that would have, like, and, and who, the, like, they aren't going to look for them in the woods either. So, I mean, there, there's the wilderness version of this too, or it can be, uh, you know, obviously it doesn't have to be that. But, you know, that's a, that's a, a pretty brilliant idea, you yeah. know. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And oh, by the way, one other thing while I'm thinking about before we go on to the next quote, you know, if the agorists were smart, and I assume some of them are because they've they've done a lot of good things, 
uh, as, as long as I've known like their history and also some particular individuals who shall go unnamed. You know, if the agorists are smart, what they would do is they would see this as a profit making opportunity. And there's kind of your ethical enclave angle in terms of like, well, yeah, pay us to basically smuggle, smuggle you out, especially the more high value the fugitive is by the state in terms of how, how many resources they're going to commit to actually like doing the manhunt, uh, the more potential profit it goes in actually running them out of the country or, or wherever. So there, there's a couple different ways one could kind of play with this. But even if it's not something exciting like a fugitive like manhunt type thing, even in terms of normal day in and day out life in a more, shall I say, preventative sense and all that, that's I think that's where the Vanu shelters really kind of uh, are, are its most value because at that point you can have your ethical enclaves and not – get into a situation, assuming everybody's got good security culture and so forth, not get into a situation that later, much, much later down the road, because somebody has now been targeted by the state and so forth, uh, would have to become a fugitive and therefore, you know, then the agorists have to smuggle them out of the country or whatever, right? So again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so whether in the context of being a preventative, which is where the Vanu shelters really shine, or even as a cure in the sense of being converted to like even a temporary underground railroad type thing. I mean, Vanu shelters are like good all around, regardless of the context yep. is pretty much what I'm saying here. You can't, you can't go wrong with a Vanu shelter. You can't go wrong. And and sorry, one other thing while I, while I think about it, you know, if the agorists were also additionally smart, even outside the context of Vanu shelters, if they can figure a way how to make profit based off of other people's uh, uh, <laughs> unfortunate circumstances and a lot of times brought on by the state, I think even they would be a lot closer to developing the Agora and, yes, even to the point of smashing the state even. If they could, like, like again, whether it's the context of a manhunt, fugitive type thing, or even other things even I honestly can't conceive of, if the agorists say, hey, how can I make money at you know, doing X that runs counter to what the state's trying to do, then yeah. So yeah, I mean like developing crypto note or, or those kind of things or any one of a thousand different types of um, entrepreneurial and even black market. I would even say just good old fashioned black market opportunities, not just gray market. Uh, yeah, if the agorists were smart, they would do that. So, uh, but yes, in the, in the context of this episode on Vanu shelters, yeah, I mean, it would be, the, it would be the underground railroad type thing. And it would also have to be different types of structures because obviously the the state agents basically trying to – let's say the FBI, hypothetically. They would basically be – I know how the profilers think basically. They're, they're saying like, oh, if somebody's being run out and we're trying to chase them down and they're getting help and assistance or you're aiding and abetting a fugitive is what they say in terms of legalese. What they try to actually look for – and yeah, I'll mention this publicly because well, I, want to, I want to keep people out of prison who don't deserve to be in prison because of victimless crimes and such. What the actual profilers and what they kind of look for is that they're looking for like the same types of structures. So if you're running somebody like between a set of apartments, they're going to be obviously going to be raiding and kicking down the doors of people in apartments. Or if it's Mick mansions, they'll do it with the Mick mansions. Or you see they're looking for – it's uh, it's essentially pattern recognition. So if you were smart, what you do is break it up and you would do all sorts of different types of shelters and structures that I'm not going to get into here publicly. OK, that's actually how you would even have a realistic attempt at actually trying to beat them at their own game, kind of. But of course, again, if an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and we don't have people being actively hunted by the state, then that's actually the best situation where we can just have our ethical enclaves. We trade with each other. We have our Vanu shelters and everything's fine. And the FBI is just, I don't know, dealing with the so-called terrorists that don't exist because they create them. Or shall I say the federal government creates them? But that's a discussion for another time, too, as to why that is. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with uh, I guess that profiling strategy, but yeah. So so I guess you're, what you're saying then is, so you'd have your wilderness location, you'd have, uh, you'd actually have like you know a Mick Mansion, uh, then you'd have you know a, a smaller sort of you know house like maybe a tiny house. Like you you'd kind of um, uh, you mix it up. You mix it up. Okay. And and enough. to be and to be fair, it, it, you know it, we, we it's it's not on us to to list every single version. The point is mix it up. You need to break up the pattern. And I'm not saying it's a guarantee. And again, my interest in saying this is I, you know, I, I don't want innocent people put in prison. Okay, that's that's and, kind and of don't, so. And don't go to a family member or friend or close friend's house because. Uh, yeah, they'll they'll yeah. know all that stuff. You want you want it to be uh, like uh, that no tie at all. 
uh, I would imagine so. Which is I don't, where the I don't have any personal experience with that. But if it's a business <laughs> and they don't know who the hell they're talking to, if it's through encryption, um, you know, that would be, uh, you know, that would be, uh, you know, the best. It's like, hey, like, well, OK, what connections do they have? Well, we don't know a connection they have with the guy they just talked to today. Um, there's no way to track that back. There's no way to, you know, compile that, uh, you know, surveillance data. Uh, that'd be would be very, very difficult. Yeah, and and again, that would be another profit making opportunity for the agorists. So it's like, yeah, they they don't know me from Sam, right? And of course, if they were smart, they you would use pseudonyms. They would kind of take some hints from the from the second realmers and a couple other things. Again, discussion for another time. But regarding the Vanu shelter specifically, here's my point. Here's my bottom line point, especially for the bludgies who may be listening. When it comes to the Vanu shelters, they can be used for all sorts of purposes. Whether they are whether they are uh, acceptable to your own fake laws or not, uh, that's the bottom line. Whether they be considered legal or illegal, they they work for all sorts of purposes. And so the only reason I'm mentioning it here is that this is a real thing that that people can actually do. Um, it doesn't involve uh, changing your fake laws or voting for your uh, political crusaders and, and so forth. This is something people can actually do to have a better quality of life. It is a lifestyle change, as is pretty much all of Vanu is, right? Shane is pretty much lifestyle changes that you can do yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and so the Vanu shelter is just another part of that. But continuing on here, and definitely for purposes of time, um, Rayo also said, quote, my present expectations are that G and I can progress to level D, primarily by refining present techniques, living mostly above ground and importing most supplies. Progressing beyond D will probably require fully underground shelters and new access techniques. I'm more optimistic about this now in March of 1973 than when I wrote this in November of 1972. At midwinter, our Pliny structure was doing well, and I've conceptualized lifestyles which ease interface problems, close quote. So yeah, notice the level D. That's a reference to Mean Time to Harassment, isn't it, Shane? Yes, yes, it it definitely is. It definitely is. And <clears throat> with the underground stru underground structures, the, obviously the the reason those would be D level is because they're permanent autonomous zones. Sure, you could have m m multiples of them, um, but like I like I said, you know, uh, earlier on. Uh, I really do think, I, I mean, the the sources are corroborating this, but again, we've had sources corroborate things before, uh, like the name of Rayo's Freemate, and we've st we're still confused. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I kind of led to believe that he did go for the underground structures. Um, so, I, I I think that's that, that's kind of interesting there. Um, so that'd be you know progressing beyond deal across fully underground shelters and uh, new access techniques. Uh, new access techniques. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that have to do with the underground structures. I mean, how do you get into it? Uh, how do you deseal the entrance? Um, yeah, I don't know. That that'd be uh, that'd be interesting. And unfortunately, we don't have. I mean, he drew up all sorts of diagrams and tutorials on uh, you know the foam hut and the polyethylene polyethylene a tent. Um, and he also he did talk a little bit. Uh, actually, I, I guess I, I let me let me back up here. Uh, and how to um, build and design with natural timbers, he did um, kind of talk about, uh, you know, kind of a, a little bit about how to build that underground structure. Uh, so, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, and the Pliny structure would be more of kind of a, I think it'd, it'd be more like in between, like some of it's underground, some of it's not. Uh, if, if I remember correctly, because he compared that to the shoe swap dwelling, which the bottom the bottom portion is you know in the ground, so you kind of use some of that that uh, you know the heat of the earth, um, you know which which helps with winter. Uh, and then you obviously obviously toss the foam, foam hut in there, uh, but I think that's more of a combination the Pliny is um, rather than just the polyethylene a tent, which is all above ground, uh, you know honestly. So uh, very interesting points there, and it's, it's I, I like I like when he points out the mean time to harassment, uh, you know the MTH level. Um, in his articles, he, gives, he actually gives you an idea, and I like that he carried that through all the way, you know, from the 60s, you know, till, you know, 11 months before he, you know, disappeared. Yeah, because he was serious about actually measuring the efficacy of Vanu, as we explained in much more detail in the uh, MTH episode back in season one, right? And so it's, uh, it's kind of uh, all that all over again. So yes, in the context of Vanu shelters, yeah, I mean... I think pretty much we're starting from C level Vanu and then going to D level Vanu and then up from there, right? Um, so we're, you know, like mobility of the shelters and then which are temporary autonomous zones and then going from there to like a more permanent autonomous zone or closer to that, uh, like a private city once you get up to, 
what what whether what is it uh, private city was like FH or I or it was it was really high up there uh, whatever the MTH uh, level was. But yeah, obviously to keep things uh, realistic to what's achievable at least for now uh, in terms of Anu shelters. I mean, we're really talking about C and D for now. Yes, yes, and um, and, and, and see what see with Rayo, and this is exactly. And like we're we're talking about Rayo here. Like if, if for those of you who've been listening to this podcast, have, have read his book, and for those of you who've read his book, I've been you know posting about it. Uh, I've seen in the past week people who have just recently gotten on board. I I scroll through like I scroll through fascist book, and I'll see like the first line of a sentence, and I'm like that's a quote from Rayo, and I'll expand it, and it's like hell yeah, they're posting quotes from his book. So for those of you who you know have have listened to the podcast, read his book, uh, you understand that Ray was a very unique individual. Uh, he was a very unique individual. He was you know pretty advanced. Um, you know, with his with his engineering capabilities, but he still, you know, he he walked before he ran a marathon. You know, he's that that overused, you know, kind of cliche example again. Um, but uh, uh, like he he started with you know the world, he started with a van nomadism, which you know, granted that is you know sea level. And then he kind of worked back, you know, kind of uh, in between B level and C level, where he did have that polyethylene A tent. Uh, and then he moved into, you know, so he went from, you know, kind of the C kind of, you know, to a BC sort of level. And then he worked, and then he worked up to uh, like a D with underground structure. So even Rayo, you know, were, like he, he worked on this, you know, increase his competency and, uh, you know, what was working towards, or, you know, again, you know, uh, from the sources, uh, he worked up to that, that D level Vanu. Uh, so I think that's worth pointing out. Yeah, so again, there's there's a genuine sense of humility here that I think Rayo was very good at kind of demonstrating by example. And I would kind of suggest to people listening to this that you ought to seriously kind of do the same thing too. And um, again, there's nothing wrong about talking about free aisles, free ports, and private cities. Like, you know, please see our earlier episode this very season about that uh, those related topics. But at the same time, in terms of the uh, liberty in our lifetime, to borrow a slogan from a certain organization I don't particularly care for, yeah. uh, in terms of our liberty in our lifetime, uh, yeah, um, maybe the next generation, maybe. I mean, how quickly – here's an interesting question for, for you listeners to kind of think about uh, as we are you know, transition to our conclusionary points here. But think about this. How quickly – are humans in general willing to exorcise the collectivist spooks from their own individual heads? How quickly are we talking here, just in terms of speed? Yes, in, even in an ev evolutionary, uh, social evolutionary sense even, how quickly are they going to choose individually to exorcise the collectivist spooks from their heads? Well, quickly, I mean, I'm thinking you more like, well, if. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then, and and so so the private city thing is like, that's interesting, and yeah, it's it's part of the libertarian history, so it would be it would be, uh, not uh, it would be kind of disingenuous to some degree to completely ignore it, but we've addressed it here. We've addressed it. It's part of the history. Uh, and now that we've addressed it in this season, it's kind of like, okay, let's, let's get to the more practical stuff. Come on. And, you know, like, uh, does anybody re really want to strategically relocate to South America? Like, really? Come on. Let's like, you know, no, <laughs> so at least not me. So, um, but like strategic relocation is a real thing and van, van nomadism is a real thing. And the minimalist sailboating is a real thing, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that, that, that's kind of, that's kind of something to really kind of take away in terms of Rayo getting to you know d-level vanu is that you know he put one one foot in front of the other and uh you know kept ke keeping on keeping on and uh he had successes unlike political crusaders who have no successes or even worse grow the power of the state rayo by contrast actually developed something through his forms of direct action which did make him more invulnerable to coercion didn't he yeah, yeah, I, I, that's that's certainly accurate. That's certainly accurate. And I, I want to reemphasize this point again. Uh, you know, on the subject of you know, uh, you know, Vanu shelters or Vanu home bases. Uh, I, 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 I love the fact that you know Rayo emphasized so heavily. And this is you know just from his book, Vanu: The Search for Personal Freedom. He emphasized so heavily, heavily that you know this is the first step. 
uh, this is the very first step because if you don't have that place where you're most invulnerable to coercion, you know, that being the Vani shelter, the Vani home base, then I, I mean, I think he was kind of thinking the same thing. On the little, what the hell are you doing? Uh, I mean, if, if you're if you're going to be you know semi vulnerable at all times, then you're not you know then, then you're not a Vanuan. Uh, the goal is to become you know more invulnerable to coercion, not uh, you know start off. Uh, you know, in a, I guess, maybe a paradoxical sort of situation, like, well, I'm not invulnerable to coercion, I'm not vulnerable to coercion, I'm not, I'm, I'm both at the same time, and I'm, I'm, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> none at the same time, too. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think the Vana Shelter is, is certainly, you know, the, the, the starting point, the starting point, uh, because your import-exports, you know, builds off of that, too. Uh, and that one directional isolationism. So it's the most invul it's a place where you're most invulnerable to coercion, and it's a crucial aspect to uh, import export, which uh, again, it's absolutely crucial. You know, import export is is you know the, the importing uh, importing of goods and knowledge to your your mono home base and exporting that labor. Uh, that's that's extremely important. Yes, and and bo and before we uh, get on with with the rest of the conclusion, you said something interesting. I just want to kind of pop up because. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there will be a, and this is a little bit of a sneak peek for you guys, there will be an episode later in this season two of ours on Vanu in the cities. Oh, yeah. Okay, here's an interesting question to kind of ponder before we do that episode. Think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Can an apartment become a Vanu shelter under certain conditions? That is actually a rather uh, fascinating question because we're debating on whether it's an important issue or not. Yeah, that's it's an, it's an important question in, in, in the development of Vanu, yeah, especially you know, mm -hmm. Vanu in cities. Yeah, for sure. And, and I would kind of just kind of suggest that when we do that episode, we'll directly try to answer uh, that question. But between now and then, while you're thinking about Vanu shelters more generally, just ask yourselves this question. Under what circumstances would it be possible, if any, to turn pretty much any apartment into a Vanu shelter. Just something to chew on. Not going to answer it uh, this episode, but we will We will definitely get into the weeds in at least some degree when we do the episode on Vanu in cities. Just something to chew on. So as we uh, are now into the conclusion, conclusions, yeah, we'd be plural, right? Uh, the conclusions. I think something about the Vanu shelters is that this is the type of thing where you're going to be the most invulnerable to coercion, right? So as opposed to like, it's basically like the polar opposite of a traffic stop, right? Where you're like the most vulnerable to coercion, right? <laughs> Side of the yeah. road and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Vanu shelters, I mean, th this is this is where... I would say aside from fin pursuing financial independence, I mean, this this is pretty much kind of where it's at, you know. Uh, this is where you're going to be invested. I mean, like Ray himself said, I mean, we're spending most of our time not even chasing, you know, the so-called money, really the Federal Reserve notes, but we're, uh, we're developing our shelters. This is what we're doing most of the time. And that, I think, is rather quite important. So when it comes to the practicality of Vanu, of actually, shall we say, the practice of Vanu, one of those practices, and maybe even perhaps the most important or really kind of up there, would be developing the Vanu shelters, whatever those happen to be. And this can merge with other things. Like, again, like the van nomadism, well, the van was a type of Vanu shelter. So you kind of have a merging of different things there and so forth. So, like, the van nomadism wouldn't just be a way of, strate of, of strategically relocating, it would also serve as a Vanu shelter. So, as you can kind of see, the practice of Vanu can take different types of methods, techniques, and yes, even concepts, and depending on how you use them, can blend them all together in a way that makes you, well, more invulnerable to coercion than you were before. Yes, yes, I, I yeah, I, I certainly agree. I certainly agree. And actually, I, I, it's a conclusion. I'll go ahead and mention it. Um, but, you know, I, I've been thinking, Kyle, and uh, obviously I'm a sailboat guy, right? I, yes. I, I'm kind of known yeah. as a sailboat guy. Yeah, that's, you're that's the how, sail... That's how, that's, I got, that's how I got the communication specialist position at the Marinia Project. Yes, so apparently it's getting out there. Um, but, uh, you know, I've actually been thinking... I, I've been, you've done some further thinking on it, and, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, getting you know getting to where I want to be faster, you know, the van nomadism thing, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't seem to be... Uh, it seems to be pretty appealing. Uh, you know, as far as especially the cost, I mean, you don't have to spend a whole lot of money to do that. You know, a sailboat can be a little more expensive and all, all the other factors that go into it that we talked about, uh, you know, such as kind of the major learning curve. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually I'm semi-considering van nomadism. 
Um, but, uh, but anyways, anyways, yeah, I mean, just as, as, as Vonnie shelters, I mean, no matter which one you choose, if it's going to be a van, if it's going to be a sailboat, if it's going to be, uh, you know, a polyethylene A tent, if it's going to be an underground dwelling, a shoe swap dwelling or whatever, uh, you know, the, the point is, yeah, it's, 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 it's the place you're going to be most invulnerable to coercion. And uh, I think that's worth reiterating, reiter, reiterating again, uh, you know, being in a 10th floor apartment in Chicago, uh, Chicago as I like to call it, <laughs> uh, yeah, not very, uh, you know, uh, invulnerable to coercion, uh, at all. Uh, now, you know, maybe, maybe that would be, well, like, maybe we should take a very extreme example when we touch on that Bonnie Wynn Cities episode, like, uh, like, could you be in, like, a really bad part of New York City, or, like, I don't know, some extreme example, we'll, 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 we'll postulate that later the on. The slums, but, like, like, like a yeah, slums or like a ghetto type something, thing. Yeah, something where, where, like, you know, coercion is everywhere, you know, not just from bludgies, but also, you know, private as well. Public and private. So, is, is there a way to, I guess, uh, you know, come up with solutions, solutions for that? Because I do think... As far as, you know, Vanu, uh, you know, not everyone wants to do uh, wilderness Vanu. Not everyone wants to do van nomadism. Some people, you know, like living in the cities. So I think that strategy is uh, needs to be developed. Or at the very least, there are people who would like to do those things, but they need something like now, today. Like, they can't wait, like, however much time it would take to uh, develop those other things uh, for themselves. Like, they need to be in vulnerable coercion like today because they're trying not to get, you know, bumped off or whatever. So, I mean, right. like, again, desperation can also be, um, well, maybe not desperation, but necessity or, or I'm trying to think of the right word. But basically, the exigencies of the moment can sometimes uh, encourage some forms of innovation under certain, certain circumstances. So, again, I don't mean to sound too much like a bureaucrat with all those qualifications, but it's like, yeah, if somebody's interested in Vanu, but they're, like, too poor and or, for now, uh, or and or they're just surrounded by too much uh, violence around them for now, then, yeah, they need some kind of, like, mitigation type thing. So, you know, to keep themselves at least a little bit safer, at least for now. And I don't and I don't think that's unreasonable at all, because I wouldn't be surprised if there was a couple of our listeners who are living in a kind of nasty slum type situation with with drive by shootings and whatever else. And so it's like, hey, you know. Uh, you know, maybe certain routes uh, around certain, you know, bad neighborhoods is is perfectly the right thing to do. So you can kind of avoid that kind of trouble. And no, it's not racist to say that because some of the lefties are kind of like, oh, well, you, in order not to be, you know, prejudiced, you have to walk through the dangerous parts of town. And of course, they never walk through those parts <laughs> of town despite all their multiculturalism. So it's kind of like, you know, yeah, no, 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 that that that's just no, no, a topic for another time. But no. Anyway, um, other conclusionary points here. Um, yeah, the Vanu shelters, like was mentioned at the beginning, are really are crucial to good import-export. If you think about this, you know, it's one thing to export your labor and products out of the servile society, but then it's like, where is that stuff coming from? And then, of course, in terms of import, that one's kind of even more obvious in some sense, right? Okay, you're importing you know, goods and, and knowledge, but then where is that going? Like, where, where do you, wait a minute, where do you store the goods that you get from the servile society? Well, you stored your Vanu shelter, right? So that's kind of rather interesting. So yeah, the Vanu shelters are crucial to import export, right? You can't really have that one directional isolation without the Vanu shelter. Right. Um, I would also say the following too. If you're not serious about having a hardened home, really don't even bother pursuing Vanu at all. Um, you know, I, I would say this. It would seem to be the case that really having one Vanu shelter is like a bare minimum to do this effectively. And obviously, as, as one of the earlier quotes where Rayo was even addressing having multiple shelters, uh, you know, multiple ones are preferable. But at bare minimum, you got to have one somewhere. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, at this point, I mean, Shane, I mean, I'm all, I'm, hold on, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm thinking about this off the fly, but even some of the survivalists have mentioned things like spider holes. You know, in some sense, even a spider hole could be kind of like the really, 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 really poor man's Vanu shelter. I mean, like, literally, it's a hole in the ground that soldiers used, like, when they're uh, to hide from the enemy, especially. Right, right. Yeah, whether, and, and there's actually a survivalist term for, you know, having those multiple Vanu shelters being a network, network of safe houses, right? Yeah, or something like that, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, even, even if you're kind of, um, 
even if you've just started pursuing financial independence and for now you're a little bit hard up uh, financially in terms of money, I mean, like how how hard is it to construct or let me put it this way, how expensive is it to construct a uh, spider hole or multiple spider holes? I mean, that's that's real. That that's even I'll admit, even for me, that's rough in it. But those spider holes have have their own applications, right? The point is to like hide from the enemy, and then if you need to pop out and you know like pop uh, you know pop their skulls out or whatever, then that's that. Of course, that's assuming more of like even like a war or revolution type situation, or or even like vigilantism to some degree, um, self defense type situations. What I'm kind of getting at, but even outside the context of what those spider holes were originally designed for, like if you're really hard up and you need a Vanu shelter, like. If you can learn how to construct a spider hole, and preferably more than one, then that's something to at least get your foot in the door. So not to mix metaphors, right? Uh, that's something to kind of get your foot in the door in terms of a Vanu shelter. Is you know consider learning how to build uh, spider holes, and then develop it from there as your finances and of course personal interest allow. But yeah, I never wanted anybody to say that oh Vanu shelters cost too much. No, 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 no. Dig a spider hole, make one. <laughs> if you're really hard up and you need invulnerability to coercion right now, I would say spider holes are pretty much where it's at. Now, they're not very comfortable and they're dirty. That's true. Um, and uh, people with claustrophobia probably would not be very good with it because there's not a lot of space. But it gets the job done and it's cheap. Um, now having said that, if you folks, well, I want comfort and I want a little bit of room, even if it's just in the van, well, then it's going to cost some money. And then maybe you guys should like, you know, be a little bit more frugal with your spending, you know, as was mentioned in the financial independence episode, but I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. So for those who are this person listening first, their first time listening to this podcast, uh, you just got recommended to go dig a spider hole. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of possibilities <laughs> for, for Vanu home bases, but yeah, that would obviously be the cheapest one. Uh, but yeah, as, uh, like I said, just a moment ago, I mean, the vein nomadism is seeming more attractive because it'll cost less. Uh, yes. it'll cost, uh, you know, significantly, you know, significantly less, uh, than would the uh, minimal sailboating. So it yeah. doesn't mean that I'll never do the sailboating. Uh, you know, I'm going. I, I want to. It's 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 my it's my. I guess you could call it my dream. Um, but uh, but you know, just uh, you know, whatever will make me more invulnerable to coercion. And if that's vain nomadism, then it's vain nomadism. So, um, I, I guess that's 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 kind of where it's at. Yeah, exactly. And also keep in mind too, you know, as your finances allow and all that, there's all sorts of products and techniques available that can help increase the security uh, of your homes, whether it's like the safety or security film that you can apply on the windows, whether it's like reinforced walls, like like uh, for example, uh, like cinder blocks that are reinforced with uh, rebar and concrete. Um, and then of course there's various different types of early detection systems, whether they be of a more digital nature where you use a smartphone or even more um, more old-fashioned early detection systems. I think, uh, Shane, remind me, did Rayo mention something about using aluminum cans, or is that somebody else? Yeah, so I, I'm trying to remember exactly what the context was for that. Uh, it was either... I don't think it was early detection per se, but but it it was it was a defense measure. Um, so what he would do, uh, you know, out like you know, you know, decent ways away from his uh from his camp, he would put uh, he would hang you know um, a string with like four aluminum cans on it, so that when the wind blew, those would you know cause noise and ruckus. Um, therefore, you know, someone's going to go in that location rather than rather than his volume home base would be deterrence. Um, so that was one thing that he did. I suppose you could have something similar. Uh, you know, as far as uh, early detection systems, if you just had, a, oh, uh, uh, I don't know, if you just had, you know, uh, if you laid out like a, you know, a, a piece of metal like underneath, uh, like, you know, like foot, like, let's say Shen level, uh, and you like surround your premises with that, I guess. Your premises, not we're not talking philosophy here. Uh, premises, uh, <laughs> uh, and you just like you know like you just hang cans on there, and if someone walks through that, you hear the can. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of ways to do that. It doesn't take a you know like you don't have to spend you know thousand dollars on a really high tech security system. I mean, you can use aluminum cans. Like like there's old fashioned techniques that Rio used uh, that you could still use uh, today. Uh, so so yeah, that that's certainly interesting one to bring up. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, I think I wrote an article that was uh, about harden about hardening your home, and there's more details about that. It's also in the uh, my last book, uh, Just Below the Surface: uh, A Guide to Security Culture, which includes that article as a chapter. And so, yes, I mean, this is this is also part of um, having good security cultures, having a hardened home, which is a Vanu shelter is basically a type of hardened home, really, you know, and in, 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 in is is really definitely a, a good way of putting it. At least I think so. So. Uh, so, Shane, is there anything else you'd like to mention for this episode on Vanu shelters? Um, I, I guess just one thing in regards to uh, to, to your last book, uh, just below the surface, the guide to security culture that is for sale on Amazon. If anyone wants to pick that up, uh, just search for you know just below the surface, or you know search for Kyle Reardon or Shane Randall, people to pick it up. Uh, but yeah, that that one's up there uh, if you guys are interested in uh, in checking that out. Uh, but other than that, you know, uh, as I as as we've said many times this far, I mean, you know, Vanu Vanu home bases, Vanu shelters are where it's at. Uh, it's the starting point. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, found a libertarian country before you can secure a Vanu home base. Uh, you just can't do it. Uh, and, you know, history is, uh, you know, uh, um, has bore that fact. Uh, so, yeah, you know, uh, you're in the Servile Society, you know, you're working towards Vanuans. Uh, well, you know, get that nest egg and start, you know, looking into your Vanu home base. What's it going to be? Is it going to be a van? Is it going to be a sailboat? Uh, are you going to do the uh, polyethylene <laughs> tents? Uh, are you going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, live in a Shushwap dwelling? Uh, are you going to live in uh, the Plinas that uh, Rayo talked about? I mean, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Uh, you've got to figure that out. Uh, that's the, 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 the biggest first step uh, and probably the, uh, the most important decision that you'll make because uh, everything else is, you know, <laughs> uh, built off of that. So you want to make sure you do that part right. Alrighty, and uh, that's all we have for you. Make sure to check out the website, vanupodcast.com. Please consider leaving us a financial contribution while you're there. So we talked about Vanu home bases this week, and next week we'll fill you in on Rayo's food storage setup. Aw, oh, yeah. So thanks so much to y'all. We'll talk to you next week.